Hey everyone, this video is a bit of a follow-up to a previous video I did on space politics and the colonization of our solar system. Go watch that one first or afterwards if you find the topic interesting. While my previous video was a broader look on the topic as a whole, in this video I will try to look into how industry and eventually perhaps entire states or countries centered around other celestial bodies may function and become economically feasible as we spread out into the solar system as well as get an idea of how the overall solar system economy could potentially function. The reason I chose this topic is that one of the first things that pops up in my mind when thinking of solar system colonization is how it could even make sense economically. In the near future, Artemis will get us a small lunar settlement and orbital station, but those will be full of researchers and more comparable to Antarctica today, as space in general is just not very hospitable to life, much less hospitable than Antarctica. And more importantly, maintaining such a presence out there is expensive as long as we're reliant on resupplies from Earth. So, what economic incentives are there that could potentially support future political entities in space? There is an abundance of resources for one. Space mining could become a very lucrative industry in the coming centuries, although it will take a large initial investment to get there. It is important to keep in mind that space mining doesn't necessarily have to be to benefit Earth directly from the get-go. Earth also has an abundance of resources, so space travel has to become much cheaper before that's economically feasible. At first, a lot of space mining and space infrastructure would simply be to support the people that with time will be living in space, such as on the coming American Lunar Space Station and surface space, as it would be a lot cheaper for NASA to gather resources on the lunar surface itself than to launch a boatload of metals from the Earth's surface, something which is very expensive due to Earth's gravity well. A bit further down the line, gathering rare Earth metals from asteroids for electronics used on the moon may even be cheaper than launching them from Earth. That doesn't mean space mining couldn't benefit the Earth in the long term though. It's just that it's necessary for us to get a lot of space infrastructure up and running before it really becomes lucrative. Essentially, the main hurdle is that we're currently forced to build our vehicles on the Earth's surface. It's not that expensive to bring resources to the Earth from space thanks to our atmosphere, which can be used to slow things down. But it is very expensive for things to leave the Earth, even with fully reusable rockets, simply because of the delta V required. With fully reusable rockets, mining of extremely rare materials could possibly be worthwhile, as we'd only be paying for the fuel and some maintenance. But for the space mining industry to really grow, we need to construct or transport vehicles in space, not on the Earth's surface. This is totally feasible, but as I mentioned earlier, requires a large initial investment. A significant human presence on the south pole of the moon, for instance, could be such a first step, as it has all the materials required for rocket construction and refueling, and launching rockets from the moon costs a fraction of launching from Earth. So generally speaking, the first space infrastructure we will build and mining we will do will be fairly expensive, and mostly to support the research stations we have in space itself. The main incentive being that it's cheaper than having to bring resources from Earth, and NASA and other space agencies would obviously want to save those funds. With time, a niche rare metals mining industry in space may or may not become economically viable. But further down the line, when space infrastructure has been expanded to the point where we can construct rockets in space, likely on the moon, we will certainly reach a point where space mining suddenly becomes a much more lucrative business that could perhaps even one day replace mining on Earth entirely and support states or political entities centered around other celestial bodies like the moon or elsewhere in the solar system. Another industry which may become viable in space and kickstart our expansion of space infrastructure is orbital manufacturing. Orbital manufacturing eliminates a lot of processes caused by gravity, allowing for unique manufacturing opportunities particularly when it comes to composite materials, certain alloys, and really anything that at some point in the manufacturing process is a liquid, as Earth's gravity constantly pushes liquids down, limiting manufacturing capabilities. Once again, development of infrastructure in space is necessary for this to become really lucrative and actually replace Earth manufacturing. So orbital manufacturing will likely start out as a small industry with few niche applications where the benefits outweigh the cost. One specific example of a niche industry where space manufacturing might make sense in the near future is with fiber optic cables made from Z-Blan. During the spooling of Z-Blan, gravity creates inconsistencies in the crystalline structure of it. This is a problem for fiber optic cables as it creates latency. In a microgravity environment, however, you could spool almost perfect Z-Blan fiber optic cable and much more of it as more material can be used in microgravity. 
Overall, space manufacturing will start out as a small industry, focusing on the few niche products that benefit the most from microgravity. With time as space infrastructure grows and we can get our resources from space and even build our rockets in space, is when we can expect space manufacturing to become a big industry, perhaps one that even replaces a lot of manufacturing here on Earth. More long term, I imagine we will see different parts of the solar system play different roles in the overall solar system economy. Although this is extremely speculative, as I can barely even imagine what a civilization with orders of magnitude more energy output and resources than us today would be up to. But as we do know the composition of our solar system, we can say that generally speaking the inner planets and asteroid belt will be where we get our metals and materials for construction, whereas the outer solar system would be where we get our water. In this last part of the video, I want to focus on how political entities and other celestial bodies may draw up borders and generally function. To start off, I'd like to point out we will not have a solar system map like this one day. It's a cool concept, but planets and asteroids move around, there would be no way to maintain borders in space. It will probably also be a lot more complicated than this map here, as humans won't just be living on other celestial bodies, but probably also on space stations and near important resources. More than likely, space itself will be international waters, and political entities will claim parts of or entire celestial bodies and stations. Of course, there probably won't be any borders on the space stations, they'll probably just govern themselves. But what will determine political boundaries on larger celestial bodies such as Mars or the Moon will be nothing like here on Earth. Natural boundaries won't matter as much and demographics won't work like on Earth. It won't make nearly as much sense to connect a piece of land to a certain people, as the people will be spending pretty much all their time within habitats, unless they have some specific work to do outside. What will determine borders, rather, is almost exclusively resources. To avoid conflict, powers will likely negotiate these boundaries and have a bit of a race to who gets to the most lucrative spots first. In my last video, I mentioned dividing Shackleton Crater on the moon in half just as an example. Natural boundaries will only really be a factor on somewhere like Mars, where launch costs are high enough that using rovers or rail for transportation of people and resources like on Earth makes sense. But on celestial bodies like the Moon or Ceres, where it takes next to nothing to reach orbit, we'll probably be using reusable rockets to transport materials, not surface vehicles. Unlike on Mars, permanent settlers on extremely low gravity celestial bodies like Ceres will likely also have to live in centrifuge habitats, as it would be incredibly impractical to move around and damaging for your body long term. These rotating habitats could perhaps be dug into the surface and look something like this illustration here. Not quite what they went for in the Expanse where they spun up Ceres and various asteroids. While the Expanse concepts are cool, it would in reality tear Ceres or any other dwarf planet or asteroid apart, and cost so much in resources and energy that you might as well just build an O'Neill cylinder. Smaller centrifuges like this meanwhile could actually work. Of course rotating habitats that aren't limited to the surface of celestial bodies like O'Neill cylinders or other forms of rotating space stations could also house much of humanity in the more distant future as we settle the solar system. I think this will cause a significant change in how humanity organizes itself. Just to get a brief overview, humanity has had several ways of organizing itself throughout history, the nation state just being the current way we do things. But in the past we went from small hunter-gatherer communities, to city-states relying on agriculture and trade, to feudal states with a hierarchy of smaller societies, to empires, to finally the nation state. A fairly new invention that ties some sort of identity to the government, whether that be an ethnic group, a religion, or simply a set of ideological beliefs. But when people live in habitats, home to perhaps just hundreds or thousands of people, do nation states even make sense? I don't think so. A lot of these communities would be incredibly isolated from one another due to the vast distances and long travel times, as well as communication delays due to the limited speed of light. These communities would develop their own culture and customs, and they wouldn't really be able to project power over one another, as any conflict would just mean the death of everyone with how fragile our settlements in space would be compared to here on Earth. I think some new form of organizing ourselves will come about, and I don't know exactly what it'll look like. Perhaps each habitat will have a lot of local governance, with some UN or EU-like organization creating some general rules to play by, and with trade ties and mutually assured destruction keeping communities civil and cooperative with one another. This is frankly a very speculative topic, but it's certainly interesting to think about. Each habitat or station sort of being its own political entity with its own little council or government is actually also a lot closer to how human societies originally functioned. 
While this might be crushing your dreams of space empires, it might actually work quite well as long as we have some form of overall international law we abide by. It is also totally possible Earth governments start by carving out empires though, with them slowly transitioning into the many sort of independent entities like I propose. I don't claim to have the answers here. I'm simply making an observation that communities in space would be extremely isolated from one another, which as I see it is an environment that favors a bunch of small self-governing entities a few centuries down the line when cultures diverge. But that's about all for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this in the future. Thank you to all my channel members, and a special thank you to my second tier member, Lada Hino. See you all next time.